are now entering the Cue the Muses podcast. Please reserve submission of any join meter statistics until after the program. What's up, people? We back. We here. We are here. Oh, I it added is, an R in there. It is a night of the week. We are recording this early. We will probably post this several days down the line. But yep. hearing this live from your speaker audio system. We're hearing it live. It's live right now. You guys <laughs> don't get to hear it live, but we get to hear it live. I think in general, <laughs> we've been putting out an episode every Friday for this is now the eighth week. So... Big pat on the back and round of applause for us. We have talked to each other eight times. <laughs> eight times. If, we, if we hit an hour mark, that means we spent eight hours in the last several months. We've kind of done it because we went past an hour a couple of times. I think we, yeah, yeah. And we saw each other in person once while you were in town and we came up with some good battle plans for how to, some marketing yeah. ideas for Cue the Muses. And that was good. And by the way, people, Cue the Muses, just to reestablish if you're new to the program, what it is is we actually made a sci fi scripted comedy show, but we're also a rock band. And so we unveil a new song in each episode from our yet to be released album. And each music video is a part of the unfolding story. And each music video is kind of like, well, that's what we're going to talk about it a little bit today. But we, I try to go all out on every aspect of it. So it feels like a full production thing that you would expect to see on, you know, the uh, Netflix or, you know, HBO and all that jazz or in a theater. Originally yeah. it was trying to be a movie in a theater, but we'll, I don't know if that'll work out. Anyway, <laughs> over to you, Dick. <laughs> at, at, at some time, you know, we, we would like to try to release it in a theater, but I'd, I'd like to hear, you know, a couple people's takes. If anyone out there listening has seen the videos and seen the production and, yes. and just, it was it was done with there's no budget and we're not we're not exaggerating the amount of money that we didn't have there was there was none it was all thrown together with with nothing and i i just would like to hear a take and and see how people think it compares to you know some of those other videos like as you were telling me before we got started uh the band falling in reverse had a video for what was the name of the song Voices in my head. I remember seeing that about a year ago and I couldn't believe the budget behind it. It was a pretty amazing video. I got to give them credit for that. Yeah, they, 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 I've seen, they have a couple of really cool videos and it is funny. Following it reverse was a band I heard of through, through David Rowe, um, vocalist for my group and, and the, the, one of the two vocalists on our second single afraid he, um, he really, he really liked their song. They had a song called Zombified, and the Zombified. Okay, yeah, I heard that one. Had yeah, had a super catchy chorus, you know, and they're you know they're pretty damn they're, catchy. Yeah, really good. They have another song called Popular Monster that my son really liked, and I guilty pleasure. I have spent you know many times riding the trip back and forth from north to south Florida, and had Popular Monster on just getting down to the groove of that song because it is nice. a catchy, nice, good song. but. But the other day, about um, the, the vocalist for Fallen at Reverse the other day, Ronnie, I think his last name is pronounced Rack. It's R A D K E. Um, he uh, will back up a little bit. I'm a member of this group online. It's called the G Gent Shit Posting, right? So the okay. genre, Gent, Gent, like, you know, Meshuggah, like, and this group on, on Facebook, Gent Shit Posting, is just that. They just like, he shit all over everything. It's, it's all satirical. It's, it's silly, fun stuff. But someone in that group posted an article um, on the website, We Are The Pit, and it was about the vocalist for Falling In Reverse, Ronnie, and had some sort of meltdown. Like, he, he said some some dumb things, it seemed like, you know, may, maybe in a heat of whatever. But what what struck me was that he said the, the genre metal core was easy. He said, "Oh, it's 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 entirely easier to write a metalcore song than to write a number one hit single on the Billboard Top 200." And like he said that, like it was news that nobody knew, or it was an unpopular opinion. And I kind of like took it in this weird way, like, 
well, yeah, of course, of course it's easier to do metal core. So I did this whole video. This was yesterday. I did this whole video about, I, I wrote a song real quick. I had a couple riffs of, in my mind that, that I was going to use. So I wrote it, tracked it, put the drums on it, put some bass on it. I like that main riff. Slapped it on YouTube. Yeah. And it was like, of course it's easy. This is how easy I did this in two hours. And for yeah. some reason that was like this special time in YouTube. I never saw this kind of velocity, but yesterday it was just a popular topic and it yeah. exploded. I had, I, it, I didn't get, I didn't start getting views until about eight 30. I posted at eight 30 and then around nine or 10, it picked up and it, it generated between, fast. <laughs> within a half hour to an hour. That's pretty good. Yeah, between nine or 10 o'clock it started and then it peaked from, so it had 50 plays at nine 30. And then yeah. by, by 4 a.m. when I woke up, it was a, a, a thousand. Yeah. And, yeah. And so that's, that's a lot of international plays then. I would, I don't know if you've looked at your analytics, but that's why that can happen in the middle of the night because it's overseas yeah. and different time zones. Yeah, I haven't. And I, you know, I kind of figure overseas, if they're seven hours ahead in, in Europe, you know, that's like, I hear Europe is like the bigger the bigger area for rock music, regardless of genre, I think like it's just more of a thing. Always I have always heard for the entire time I played music, you got to get to Europe. That's where they would love you in Europe. And I feel like that is said to every rock band. And I don't know if it's I mean, I guess it's real. I, do, I have talked to bands that literally go to or in Europe. And they play very large shows and then they come here and they're barely filling, you know, they're getting a quarter of a bar full. Oh, dude, I, I, I am 100 percent sure that's accurate because so Will Hunt, right? Will, Will yeah, Hunt, yeah. The, our drummer uh, for Evanescence. I've yeah. been, I follow him on Facebook. He toured with Evanescence. He is right now touring with a band. I can't even tell you the name. It's like I had never heard of it. I saw a picture. He posted it tour uh italian tour you know hit third stop in italy with like heroes and monsters or something monsters and a yeah. band i have never heard of yeah in italy playing i mean it's will hunt but yeah, you know yeah. italy playing and i'm i'm seeing like huge like sold out looking crowds like the same size right. crowds Ginger just did at club la and destin last week yeah yeah like every night like nights of the week in italy yeah like, it's got to be huge over there. Yeah, it's a very interesting and provocative thing. I've always wanted like the concept of getting to go over to Europe and then there just being this um, actual support for rock that's on the like on so many bands that you've never even heard of that aren't on billboard charts. It just seems yeah. so hard to achieve that here. There's just not as much support. And when I say that, it's not that there's not that much support for music. It's just that rock. Oh, there's actually an echo happening for a second. Oh, but rock uh, is gone now. Rock in yeah. general, I just feel like has been a harder uh, genre to get enough support, pick up steam in lately. I mean, there's just a lot of other genres that have gotten a lot more attention in America yeah. over the last 10 years, which has been a little disheartening for people that, you know, put as much effort into learning our instruments as we do. It's like, <laughs> shouldn't it be real music, man? Shouldn't you have to play a real instrument? I mean, I like other shit, but. It's yeah. there's something amazing about going to see a live performance and they're actually playing live music with like and they're executing the musicianship on on the instruments. And there's a few yeah. less backing tracks supporting the vocalist and all that kind of jazz, you know, they're they're they're, they're totally there's an in-depth conversation. We could do a whole episode. We should, yeah, we could. That would be yeah. another topic than what we we're going to touch on tonight. But. The idea of it, but like with with backtracks and. And, you know, it's it's more popular now, but I feel like, you know, if depending on the band, like certain bands you go and see and they're they're not all they're not all backtrack heavy, even like I, I yeah. expect I expected Ginger, um, you know, I, I don't mean this in any way other than what it is. I expected Ginger to be a band that was pretty backtrack heavy, just going yeah. into the show, not not really knowing a whole lot about them, but they weren't. I mean, I was surprised. It was it was pretty much just a raw three piece music with a vocalist up front. Yeah, and yeah. I was I was I was surprised and very impressed by that. And the bands that that don't do it, you know, the like I don't know what to call them. If it's a, a traditional band, you know, the yeah. the ones more rooted in their in their in just 
plain in your face rock. You know, that's what I gravitate towards. It's not, mm. there's something out there for everybody too. I, and I like it all. I, I, you know, I, I know I kind of just chat on it a little bit, but I mean, I've seen bands perform that had backing tracks that blew me away. It's, I, it's not so much that I have an issue with that. I think where I got the most disheartened was when I was still in Kill Cluso. And I started getting really into video. And one of the first clients that I got that was consistent was going out and filming for a, a venue that was going to be the new premier rock venue in addition to doing other types of shows. And it's called Coliseum. And it's I not around that. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I played there twice. I played like there the once, you know. But th what happened was all I got booked for, I got booked for filming like 20 plus DJs. And these were the country's biggest DJs. I mean, these were sold out sure. shows, people yeah. cheering at like spilling over, breaking fire code over the top, people coming out, literally go like, oh my God, did you just see that? And it was, and still this happens. And it's just, it's, it's a thing. I mean, people can do it, but it is a dude literally at a turntable and he is just queuing up music and, and mixing some of it. Now, that being said, there was one dude that I truly thought was fantastic and worth experiencing live. And his name or his act, it was one guy, was Excision. I don't know if you ever heard any of his stuff. No, I, I can't. And can't it's say like, it. it's the dubstep stuff. I mean, it's like, but what he brought was this insane sound system. And to this day, I've never experienced the bass that this system made. And they warned me when I walked in, they're like, look, you may not be able to, you can't get too close because you may not be able to breathe. We have a, a system here. And, and when they were doing sound check, they literally broke all the top rack, all the top shelf fell off and cracked and like fell to the ground behind the bar and, mm. and shattered. That happened during sound check with it. So it was like, it was that, that. And then he also had this stage set up. There was this three dimensional hologramic thing. And he was at the top of it. He was like 15 feet in the air. And the whole thing had a projector screen being spilled onto it. So all this crazy stuff was going through it. And it was this whole architectural thing. So it was like, there was something there. Other guys literally, oh yeah, we'll put a cloth over this table. It was like us going and setting up our Q the Muse booth, but without a backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> That's for Cala, right? It's just a table and turntable. So can, that's a weird one. I can only imagine with, with turntable musicians that it's, it's just like, it's gotta be similar to bands because a, a turntable is an instrument, right? It, it can, can be an instrument. It can it, be. I've but seen I, I, people. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. One last thing I just want to mention as I would come over with the camera, because I'm getting close shots at some point I, for every DJ, I would end up on stage with them getting tight shots and yeah. literally They'll put their hand on the dial and you can see the peak meter, the peak knob. You know how every knob's got a little peak point on it, whether it's by color <laughs> or a notch. And he's just spinning his elbow like this, but he's not turning the knob at all. So he's like pretending to do all this stuff for the camera. But I can see in the camera that he's not doing anything. <laughs> and it's like, I, dude, how much of your act is just yeah. that? It's just pre-programming. You're pretending to slide knobs around. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> that's real. That did happen. I got that footage of that. that, that that's insane. You know, and it, I don't know, it, to, to, to say something, you know, with, with that era, I mean, the, the Coliseum, I did see a couple good shows at the Coliseum. I saw, Me too. Uh, I saw Chevelle play at the Coliseum. Me too. I was there. I, yeah, I played a couple local shows there. I think I played there in two bands. I, I actually went through some old videos and I was in a band called This City is Haunted. That was, it ended okay. up being, it ended up being a song name that in the course of the bands that I've been, we've had part one called the city fighting giants has a song called second city, which is a sequel. Okay. Song yeah. First running song. Theme. And then, but we were in a band, the actual band was called this city is haunted. And we played at the Coliseum twice. I think I played once at the Coliseum with company came, but whatever. But what I'm getting at is the other show we played as that band in that same time frame was a show at um, the Beta Bar, which was mm -hmm. also what what had iterations. It was the Cow House, it was the Beta Bar, it was the the I don't know, backstage lounge or something. But we played a show there with um, Three Years Hollow and I Empire, and I Empire is a band that had the bassist from Dark Dude Day, Corey mm -hmm. Lowry. 
And I saw that video and I remembered then getting back to the DJ thing. I remembered I was so, so sad, disheartened, depressed, you know, with, with the state of the music scene, when the beta bar an, an iconic room, you know, almost as iconic as Floyd's was, but the beta bar was gutted out. They, they tore down the stage, they ripped out the bar and they made the room a centerpiece for a, a center stage DJ booth. So the new layout, they built a whole floor deck system inside and it sloped. It was like at the fair when you're in like the Gravitron and the, okay. and the yeah. Dow, like the centerpiece was the DJ's booth in the middle ah. and then standing God, room, I been there forever. A, a circular. Yeah. And it was like yeah. walked in and I was, it was like, Oh, this is really cool. And then I realized what it was and there was no stage. There was no band stage. It was DJ booth only. And I, you know, I said, Oh, it, oh. it's, it's, I think times are changing. It's like, it's not it, but that's a college town bar too. So a college town bar. Well, has to and, go. and the reality is, and this was just plain out explained to me by the owner of Coliseum at that time, you know, it's, you have full band, right? He had the, in, he had the intention initially of being full rock venue. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But what it takes to put on, you got to hire all the crew. You got to do stage setup. You got to run extra lights. You got to run more sound. You got to have multiple engineers. You got to have, there's so yep. much, you got multiple people that you're paying that are in the band. You got to have an opening act. You got to have sound checks of both bands versus a table, a DJ and one person. And we're yep. already selling out with that, but we're not selling out necessarily with the rock band. And when that happened and he had that conversation with me, this was towards the end of Kill Clouseau. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, man. I might need to take a break. This is just so disheartening that, yeah. you know, and I did kind of, I mean, it wasn't like that night or anything, but over the course of that year and a half, that experience contributed to this notion that I was like, I've got to get some real work career going because i cannot keep i've got a kid i cannot keep banking on this becoming the financial success that i feel like and I, I felt it was capable of becoming but it was like getting harder and harder to really feel like that was you know th this is going to be even if we have every duck in a row it's still going to be just a chance that we make it that's the reality and that's the reality for anybody that makes it big it's like you can have everything in line you can be mega talented you can have all your stuff together and people can still pass you by and that's why if you don't believe that just how many bands do you know or how many specific little small movies have you seen that nobody knows about that are unbelievable you just don't even understand how people don't know why didn't this take off and it's because of this reality that it still takes that distribution help and that networking at the end of the day and being in the right place at the right time on top of having everything as ready to go as you possibly can. Yeah, it's like you know, when I was young, I, I heard interviews of uh, successful musicians like reading through Guitar Pro magazine or whatever. And advice that I saw constantly was, you know, if you're trying to, to go somewhere, don't don't do what's happening right now. Do your own thing because who knows what, what the next huge, you know, trend is going to be in the music industry, mm -hmm. in, the, in the entertainment industry for that matter. You know, it's don't, don't, whatever's happening right now, by the time you get ready to go, that, you know, that five minutes is over and it's, it's yeah. all on. The next thing. Yeah. And, you know, when you, when you said that, you know, about the, the, the venue owner, not, uh, you know, spending all that overhead. I remember they, they didn't have a built-in stage at the Coliseum. They right. rented, they rented from, uh, uh, I think it was a Tassican or, or, or one of those local companies, but they brought everything in. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. The stage, yeah. the light. But that reminded me of a podcast I listened to the other day that uh, I sent to you. It was about video games, but oh, that, yeah. I forgot that, you sent that. I'm sorry. I've been yeah. saying <laughs> it's still so funny. It was like I was on one of my drives home, so I had four hours to kill. And you said, you know, the Coliseum said, how come we would pay all this money for the stage, you know, the lights, all that, et cetera, when we can pay the DJ, one guy, one, one sound system, sold out house, easy mm -hmm. money. Now, the podcast was about um, the, the, the creator of the video game, Metal Gear Solid, Hayata Kojima. Um, and Hayata Kojima was in... He was like the vice president of, 
don't quote me, vice president of programming game design for Konami, right? And Konami was backing him because he was making these huge hit games, these these very and very theatrical games. Like this is a, a, a brilliant history, uh, also it, extremely interesting backstory on Kojima, uh, Hayato Kojima. He wanted to be a filmmaker and couldn't get a gig in Japan as a filmmaker. Ended up mm. being a video game maker, and his video games are very theatrical. There's a yeah. cut. There's a cut scene in a video game that is an hour and a half long. It's like what? It's, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. One of the years. I think it's that much onto the. I mean, I, I guess it's uh, I, if it's a downloadable it's, gig. Yeah, it's a, it's on the PS4. I think it's Metal okay. Gear. I think it's Metal Gear Five, but I've never played it. But I heard I, I was listening to this. I was like, man, this guy's extremely interesting. And I, you know, as they went on, long story short, to to make this quick, you know, Kojima found another person in the company. I don't know his name. They're all Japanese. I'm going to mispronounce it anyway, but. They, this other gentleman made a game that was free to play, a mobile app game, developed it, generated it. It was free to play. It was, it was a, a, they called it a freemium game. The freemium games, when you download it, no cost, but you have to pay to get stuff in the game. There's uh -huh. purchases in the game. Uh -huh. Now, and now, now <laughs> at the same time, at the same time, Kojima is asking for millions of dollars to develop this very, theatrical huge expensive game for konami and then this other guy is making millions of dollars a day at the peak of that game's height and it cost compared nothing right so, of course that that guy quickly the tables turn he quickly had kojima's job and kojima found himself leaving being forced it being forcibly demoted and then basically forced out the door mm -hmm. because it an older way of doing it that was an artistic way that was right. very it, it was it was had a lot of satisfaction to him and the people playing the games but at the end of the day the doritos game won yeah you know, it, yeah and that's that it, that story you said about the coliseum just reminded me of that it's it yeah and that cross pollinates to all all forms of entertainment when it comes down to well it. it it does and what's what's interesting about it is that it's not necessarily like a zero sum thing where because one thing's successful the other thing has no no opportunity for its own market the problem is is are you is your product digital or is it an actual tangible thing is does it have to go in a brick and mortar store like a physical album versus a digital download and it's the same thing with you know like basically a lot of things fit into that category so when we're talking about a venue this is like a brick and mortar thing there's only so many slots available it's a big deal to host you it's not free and we've got to, they've got to put up the money. They they're only going to have that amount of people in there for that one night. It's not like people can come when they want to. They got to come at specific times. Can you draw? And it, so it it's understandable. And even the venue owner himself, while I could tell he wasn't really much of a rocker, and he had the intention of putting rock, I think he genuinely did want to because he thought it would be profitable. But at the end of the day, the scenario, the comparison with the DJ table is that it's just I can't. He just said I just can't justify spending the money in this other direction because this, these are the results that I'm getting. Now, that being yeah. said, that being said, that club's not here anymore. I don't know why it fizzled out. You know, do, it did. The, I know DJs are still a, a big deal, but you know, I, we're still going to concerts and seeing lots of people there. You went to see ginger play, ginger play and defy the tyrant got open up for him. It was a packed house. These places are, I mean, rock is still very much alive. I think that it's just a little bit, there's less places to, to have it hosted in its infancy. That's a bit of a problem, you know? And so that's where enter cue the muses, right? A, a completely different approach to making a band, a completely different approach to what the product is in itself. For instance, we've never played a show before. We're a band that's never performed a show. And we're just this digital experience, this medium of movie and music to have and you can dissect it and listen to just the music if you want to but all that's available and it's free so go to cuethemuses.com <laughs> and watch episodes for free and if you don't think that it's worth checking out and you haven't checked it out i can give you some examples of what kind of music and well what kind of humor you might be missing out on like 
you know, for instance, check this out. We're kind of getting sidetracked, man. I, there's only so much time for frequency absorption. We yeah, need to hop right. on it. Can you fire up the cadence tubes? Yeah. And I'll go ahead Sorry. and get my shoes tied. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> it's just fun, man. We're like, there's some fun stuff in there and there's wild music and stuff. And so I, what I did want to touch on in this one episode and <laughs> as we reached 25 minutes in, and it was originally going to be a topic point was I just wanted to touch on, you know, for do it yourselfers out there, you know, people making their own music videos, your own recordings and this and that and stuff, you know, like one of the things that you run into, one of the most traditional approaches to making a music video, if this is what you're trying to do, is that you're going to get some full band setups and you're going to film full band performances. And then occasionally, you know, people will also get some individual performance filming uh, shots done, right? So you might film just the guitar player, just the singer. That's what I like to do. That's my approach as well. I make very performance heavy music videos in general. But one yeah, of the... It's a group as a whole with a band, right? So they're, they're, they're a unified front. They rehearse together. They write the songs together. So when they show up, it's we're, we're shooting this as a group, whether it's a practice setting or a, or a theatrical setting. But go, go, ahead, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I mean, having, having a setup like for your look that's the full band, that takes the most effort because everything's got to be right for one wide shot. And then you can go in there and get more personal shots. You can move through the band. All that's great. I've got no issue with that. I do that all the time. But one of the things is I also like to get individual shots where I'll take a person, put them into a specific setup or a, a certain combination of people, you know, maybe just the bass and drums and put them into an area and then have a setting with lighting and the cool background and the right angles and the right lensing. So then you have those kind of pepper into your music video for other cool stuff. The thing, the problem, the issue with making Cue the Muses is that I was in it. So if I'm in it, then who's filming? And I had, you know, there's just not that many cinematographers around Tallahassee that I know, and especially to do it for free and especially to be uh, available to come on a whim and who know how to use my cameras and all that kind of stuff. So one of the... If, I, if we do a full band setup, then I have no ability to monitor these massive takes and I can't look through and see what's changing. It's just so much that you're trying to corral to know if you're doing a decent job or not. So there was this idea that ended up becoming a story point in the video. But the idea was, well, maybe we only do individual shots. So that way, the only thing that we'd have to do for when I'm playing is I've got, you know, we could have three to four cameras running, could put a couple of you guys behind the cameras. I'll have a couple locked down on tripods. I'm filming in such high resolutions. I can take those and even the ones on tripods, I can add handheld movement to it. So it feels like somebody was holding it. If that's the feel that we need, even if you only pull off as a, you know, an untrained shooter, because you helped film this, you know, you know, if you haven't used my camera as much, this was like an opportunity to do that. Even if we only yeah. get a few shots here and there, I've got all these other cameras and all these backup opportunities. But by doing it as an individual, we'd only have to worry about it on that level for just me. And that way, and everybody else is filming. I know that I'm running an A camera and I'm overseeing the production on the as a whole. I can guide everybody and just focus on the, that video performance. And not not many people have take have said to me or noticed that there's literally never any time where there's a camera angle in there where we are all together as a band playing. It doesn't exist in these two long nine and nine plus minute music videos of cue the muses. Isn't that interesting that nobody's like, I, cause I don't feel like it's an unnatural experience watching it. You don't realize there's a couple, now there's a couple of trick shots you do in the edit room where there's multiple people on the screen at the same time. Right. Right. It's next. 
Now that that never actually happened. Every time you see that in any of the videos, that's Ash with his mind exploding and melting at the same time. Sitting <laughs> the computer screen, probably on hour thirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that that's the thing. It's like even if you film just individuals, you can then in the edit come up with a way of putting people on the screen at the same time. And I don't think in any of the shots does it feel, or it's not like in those shots that Dick's referencing that I try to make it look like we were in the same room at the same time per se, but it's, it's done in a way where it just feels like something kind of cool and artistic. And it ended up, what it ended up doing was it ended up making the videos in a way, not that I want to do this for every video, but it made them cooler because it was, a, it was just a, such a different approach. I'd never made any music videos where we solely only filmed ind individuals playing each of those parts. And I, I so just to give people some context here, I'm going to queue up just a, a, a clip from like the last video that we released on our single afraid, check this out for a second, just kind of get, see how it kind of, you know, blended these things together. It's pretty fun. Like it, it ended up being such an instigator of approaching the music video in such an intensely different way yeah. that it came so, out awesome. I think before we get too far away for there, there might be some people listening on Spotify that, that can't, can't oh. see. And it, like a quick description of what, what that clip just showed in the beginning was a lot of shots with an individual person that were twisting, like the, the camera was spinning. You had a, you had a, uh, what's it called? Like a vortex. Gantry, the vortex. It was the, it would hold your camera and it would spin it on its axis horizontally. It a, yeah. A gimbal years. system that could actually spin in a vortex. So we got those. Yeah. And made me so nauseous. The, <laughs> the opening shots of that scene during that clip was a lot of that kaleidoscopic type yeah. of, type of energy to the video and then there was a couple of multiple multiple um like like shifts split shifts and some some screen shares but then what happened was it it was a lot of red like everything was being looked at through a red lens and then and it got to the bigger section it looked like it was getting drowned out with water now this was just me perceiving it but then it drowned it out with water through the the effect you did and it got to the the next section and the red was gone the red like was out and it was a darker section in there. And then when Cody or Dave, I can't remember which one, they said your emotions turn red, the red bled back into it heavy, more shots with the under the bridge section in there. It yeah. just crazy, crazy transitions from shot to shot that, that you don't really, it, it just, it takes you there when you're watching it, but you don't realize how much you're seeing in just three or four seconds of that thing. Right. And that's the thing. I mean, the, I've never done effects like this before. This this whole show instigated me getting a better computer so I could learn After Effects. And so it's been, 
I mean, I'm very seasoned with Adobe Premiere and editing, but not not effects. And so when you're saying how much happens in three or four seconds, I mean, that's the thing is that, and this is the thing that's so painful about VFX shots. It's like literally some of these things that are 10 second long shots take an entire day. You know, and it's a nine and a half minute video. So you're spending a whole day and sometimes you go down a rabbit hole and you build this whole thing and then it didn't work. And then you have to uh, figure out a different way to do it or give up on it or take half of the part that did work and overlay that on one side and then come up with something else for the other side. Like, it's just like, it's just a constant journey of fucking up and also like oh i did it like i mean and and it's it's hard but it, the end result is rewarding but my god it's so time consuming um yeah. but yeah it, it's very very fun very cool kind of sp- spun it in a different direction and i just bring it up as like a do it yourself kind of thing like keep in mind guys like if you're filming most cameras nowadays if you buy a camera is going to offer at least 4k I and mean, most cameras are going to be at least 4k a lot that are coming out now, if you do put some decent money in, and when I say decent, once you get into the even $2,000 territory, you know, you or well, I, I guess maybe three, three and a half thousand, you can start getting past even 4K resolution. You start getting 6K resolution options. There's the Blackmagic Pocket 6K camera, actually. I, that might be 2,500. Maybe I'm wrong. I haven't checked back in on that in a while. Once you have this extra resolution, people say, when you first start now, like, do I need that much resolution? Well, the advantage to it is that your ability to crop in, it's not about having that much resolution per se and that it's, you're going to see a, a discernible difference with your eye. It's really about being able to crop in and create a whole new shot or a second shot out of it or cover up a mistake or, you know, oh, that light stands in the shot, but it's OK. It's 6K. I'll just crop in more. It also gives you more ability to add handheld movement to it in post. There's a lot of plugins that you can do this with where you, you know, if you do put a tripod shot up there, it can look pretty stale when you cut to that and all the other shots are handheld. You might want that handheld fill to continue on. And so you can, with that extra resolution, it gives it the opportunity to to assign movement to the shot so it can bounce around inside that video window without showing the edges. If you're only working with HD, you're not going to have that, those kinds of options available to you. You, even if you want to just deliver an HD at the end, which I personally do not recommend to anybody. If you're making content now, you need to be, you need, you really need to be putting it out in 4K. I don't know because you want to future proof it. You want to future proof it. Even if people are watching it at HD now, you got to understand 4K is going to be, and when you go watch a video on YouTube now that was put out 10 years ago and the highest resolution offering for it is 480p, it sucks. It's not good. I mean, you're 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 disappointed when you're watching it. You're you're watching a very crippled version of what that video was. Yeah, in the video quality. Now, yeah. it also would that does it also hinder you? Like, if that now, if you were using an outdated camera and trying to shop yourself, you know, is it? I mean, yeah, this is more your territory than me. But is that something like they would they would just shuffle that 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 resume off the table to the next one because you don't have the right credentials on them. If you're if you're actually doing a project for a, an, a, a legit client that's got a budget that is uh, has people helping manage the situation. Yeah, there are, there's going to be expectations there of a certain level of resolution being hit. They might even possibly have a camera list. They might even say that they're product um, specific. They want they want Sony or they want red or they want, you know, Canon or whatever it is. Um and also like Netflix, for instance, has camera uh, list. You know, you have to use a Netflix approved camera to be able to make something. And then for them to, to well, I should say this. My understanding is that, is that if they're paying for the show outright, they need it to be one of the cameras on their list that they've approved. But if you've made something independently and then sell it to them, I think you can kind of slide it in that way, but it's gotta be at a certain quality. You gotta be able to deliver a certain Kodak not just a compressed MP4. They will not take that. You got to give them like a legit ProRes 422, not just one that you converted from an MP4 file that was only 8-bit color. There's a lot of tech spec stuff to get into. Bottom line is, yes, it does matter. But if you're making stuff for an independent, you can use whatever you've got. And it's not, they're not going to know the difference as long as it looks good in the end. But I really, really recommend that you should be making your videos and filming in 4K as your minimum resolution. For future proofing even if you're delivering hd 
I can, I mean, I, I, I can see the, I can see Netflix's standpoint from that because we live in a world where, you know, in the, in the sixties, it was your neighbor had a, had the, the higher trim level car than you. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. I gotta, I gotta, get, I gotta get the GT. He's got the SL. And then, you know, net, nowadays it's the televisions, you know, I've got, I've got the newest 80 inch OLED, you know, Mac daddy, you put it on Netflix and you want that resolution to shine. And if, if yeah. the video on Netflix just simply doesn't have it, it's not Netflix's fault, but then they blame yeah. Netflix. That's a subscription based platform. Yeah. And they're, and they're, they're going to the quality get standard. I, I I'm fine with that. I mean, I think it's fine. I think their list of cameras is pretty large and pretty reasonable actually. I'm, my cameras are on there, you know, I'm, we're Netflix approved cameras, any one of them that I, you know, there's only one of the cameras that I have that's not Netflix approved and it's because it's limited to 8-bit color. But other than that, um, you can get a Netflix approved camera for 2,500 bucks. So that's not crazy. That's not a crazy investment um, yeah. at all. If you're, for, if you're talking about the tool for your trade that you're going to utilize absolutely. every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So There's no doubt. I mean, there's amplifiers that much, but now you, you told me uh, a, a couple weeks ago that, and I didn't know this till you told me that, that IMAX has its own, its own aspect ratio, right? Is that, is that right? It's, it's that not, right. it's not the same as the regular theater. An IMAX screen is shot on an IMAX camera for that particular ratio. For, for I love screen. that you brought this up because this is this ties into something that I've got a new episode coming out on my channel talking about that's uh, very interesting for people in this do-it-yourself market. And I wanted to touch on it today. You're correct. Oh, wow. IMAX cameras do have a completely different, they have a square sensor. It's a massive sensor and they're filming on, well, they're filming on film. So it's not even sensor, actually. It's 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 a 70 millimeter by 52 millimeter sized film. OK, so actual, actual film, like actual, actual. Yeah, yeah. They're IMAX oh, cameras are still film. I don't wow. I don't and, know that they have IMAX digital yet. I, I don't think they do. Now, you don't have to film on an IMAX camera to have your movie come out in IMAX or on an IMAX screen. So it can be IMAX approved even if you don't have that. The thing, the interesting part is, and why I was thinking it was cool that you brought this up is, um, there is a movie coming out that is by Gareth Edwards, and he's the dude that filmed, or directed, he directed, uh, Star Wars Rogue One. He also directed that last, got one of the Godzilla yeah. movies. And he directed um, a new movie that's coming out called The Creator. And it looks amazing. It's going to be a huge movie that comes out this fall. It's already done. It's wrapped. But the interesting thing about it is his DP, Greg Frazier, is a badass. Um, he actually filmed uh, I, almost the entire movie on a Sony FX3, which is the same class of camera as my Canon R5C. So we're talking about a $4,000 mirrorless, small little camera, and it's being released in IMAX. And, and <laughs> it's got crazy special effects to it. I mean, we're talking about this is going to be one of the sci-fi hits of the year. And the crea creator? The creator. You can look up, a, look up the preview for it, and it looks fantastic. So... Here's the deal. I heard about this movie and that it was filmed on that. I was like, no way. Like they went that route with it. Okay. I think, you know, guys with the, the, the giant, you know, the giant oversized million dollar, you know, hundred thousand dollar, you know, Ferrari camera filming those things. Well, and so an IMAX film camera is extremely large, extremely cumbersome to move around. You have to rig it up on all kinds of things to move it around. Another mm -hmm. option to that in the digital world would be the RE65. RE is a, like the creme de la creme of digital cameras. It's still a larger unit. It's a full camera. Another person would help operate that. It's got a large sensor almost to the size as the IMAX, but not quite as big, but it's large. It's what the Revenant was shot on. It was the first theatrical release movie was shot on that camera was the RE Alexa 65 digital camera. And the Revenant got like best cinematography that year, I believe. And it deserved it. It was amazing. I feel um, bad. I've never seen that movie. Oh, I know the dude. Movie. Tom, Tom was, Hardy, DiCaprio, right? Yes. And it's just, it's so good. 
I yeah. don't, it, de it definitely was an IMAX experience. It was so engulfing and huge and beautiful. It's one of the most beautifully filmed movies I've ever seen. And it was a lot of it was just handheld with this camera because you can, you're, it's liberating to be on a digital camera that doesn't have all that, all the weight of the film camera and stuff like that. So in that same vein, here's Gary, I'm sorry, Greg Frazier helping film. He's the DP for the creator. And he's, okay. his cinematography is amazing. If you saw Star Wars Rogue One, I think it was one of the best looking yeah. Star Wars films ever, uh, yeah, personally. That, that's honestly my favorite out of all the newer ones. Dude, since. it's mine too. I love the <laughs> dark, real, gritty. I thought it killed it. Yes. They, they were an amazing team. So here's the deal, though. That camera, um, what's interesting about it is I, so I saw the previews for this movie on my computer. And I watched the previews for it on YouTube. And I was like, no way. I was blown away. Everyone's talking hype about it. It is amazing. But what is interesting is like, you know, do you need a big camera like that? Well, I go to see Oppenheimer. Now, I don't know if you happen to see the preview for this movie, actually. But in our theater here, the creator was a preview that they showed before Oppenheimer because it's going to be an IMAX. And when they showed it, it's about like a child that's like the one and it's a robot. He's yes. like an AI robot. That's it. Yeah. I did see that preview. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah. See, he's on the train. It's a little kid and AI is taking That's it. Up. That's the movie. And it was and all that, filmed with like the same camera. Yeah. That's on the same same price tier as like the Canon R5C that I have, right? I I chose between those two cameras, okay? But what I just want to point out is and and it's amazing, but what's interesting about it is that when I saw it on the IMAX screen, as somebody that, you know, is a little, I could definitely, before I even heard the confirmation officially from Gareth Edwards' own mouth in a press conference that it was, I could tell that it was filmed on the FX3. And the reason is that it still, it looked amazing. I sound like such a douche here, but I, there was a difference. It, the quality level, there actually is a difference. There's like a, the noise pattern and the way that the colors gradated around the skin tones. And I could tell that they were pushing the envelope on this thing a lot. And they were doing a lot of treatment to it in post to try and get it to this point where it felt as big as it did. And they achieved it. But there is no doubt there is something magical about just using <laughs> the bigger camera and the better sensor. But it's amazing that they did this. It's amazing that it looks as good as it does. For mu for 90 percent of people, they're not going to notice the difference. Um, well, and, yeah. And yeah. From my Perspective, looking at that thing those there's people in there um sorry the the, the ai robots in the trailer the just to, to put a paint the picture here if you haven't seen the trailer for creator the they're filmed in the same shot with other people and these these ais have a hole directly through their head from ear to ear a hollow hole where they have to animate the hole the inside of the hole right. and have the real shot through the hole as the head of the person or the child is moving around and, Tons and all of the effects. Of it's so it's, and it's nuts, but you could tell, like you can tell the difference. That's the difference. I'm part of the 90% where I can't sure. the difference. Cause I, I'm not familiar. I just know if it, if what I'm looking at looks amazing or not. And, and it looks, different. it looks amazing. And there's a, I, I, and I don't, what I'm curious about, as it comes out later is I'm just curious how much treatment the actual footage got to de to denoise and enhance, you know, with all the effects that they have going into every shot. I don't know how much there was there. There's also the option to use an external recorder so you could actually film in raw rather than the 10 bit compressed codec. But I, then it starts to get bigger and then it's like, well, then you're losing the handheld experience, this small light little camera. It also has very good low light. That was one of the reasons they used it. They had to, they used way less lighting than they would normally because it's so low light sensitive. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there. There's a ton of stuff to talk about, but um, yeah, that's that's currently in the cinema world. That's a pretty big conversation point happening right now because this that it's pretty amazing. And in as far as our little land of cue the muses, and if you're happening to listen to this and we're talking to other do it yourselfers, just keep in mind, guys. You know. I know four thousand dollars does sound like a lot, but the idea that you could you can spend that level of money, obviously you need to spend more than that to get cards and a lens. But you know, if you drop five, six thousand dollars, you could literally have something that you can make it and it could go on an IMAX. I mean that that's un unreal. That's unprecedented the world that we're living in, guys. It's amazing. The tools are insane right now. So yeah. That's and it, it's it is accessible. I mean, think about yeah. five thousand versus what would an i a full-blown imax camera like because i don't know you I, yeah. I don't know if you 
but like ballpark guess. I think they're I've, over a couple hundred grand. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you're talking like pushing a quarter of a million dollars potentially versus five grand for a, for a camera that does it's a, unreal. that that performs on the same level. It might not be, you know, yeah. the other one is number one, this one's number three, yeah. but it's in the same race. It yeah. Is, it yeah. Is, it's race in the same race. That's insane. Yeah. And, and when you mentioned the aspect ratio, that's what triggered this whole conversation. Just to have said, there is a little bit of confusion and I won't get too techy with it, but the bottom line is, the, the camera doesn't actually film at the aspect ratio that is IMAX. So it is being kind of cropped and manipulated a bit. And in that you're going to have a bit of quality loss because it, it is just 4k. Um, and give some example of resolution comparison when you're filming on an IMAX camera, even though I think there's only nine IMAX screens in the country that actually play film. I think they're all digital projection in 4k. So you would say, all I need is 4K, but just understand there's down sampling normally happening from a film camera like that or a camera that can film beyond 4K. And when you down sample from a higher file, just like in audio, if you're going to down sample from something that's of much higher quality, there is some kind of difference. You know, there, there, there is. So on an IMAX, when you film, depending on how it's processed at the end, it's 12 to 18K resolution. So that, that's what you're actually getting. So then when you downsample to the 4K projection, there just is something that happens. There's this organic aspect of it that's just there. And once Oppenheimer popped on, and, and all the previews that came on that were other IMAX shot movies, I could just see the difference between the creator and it on IMAX. And that being said, why does the creator have to be IMAX? I mean, just put that thing on the normal theater screen. It's not as demanding. You'd see less difference with it. Um, it's going to look great on many other screens that it's playing on. Uh, the IMAX is just where I could kind of see the difference a bit when you're asking it to do the biggest request that you possibly could for any footage. Oh, yeah. But so, so is are they releasing it exclusively on IMAX? It's not. No, I don't think so. Just like I believe you, you can see Oppenheimer on IMAX, or you can see it on a regular screen, right? And what you're gonna, yeah. what's gonna happen is when you go see these things on regular screen, if it's formatted for IMAX, is you're now getting top and bottom stuff cropped off, and sometimes it can be pretty dramatic. There's some examples. If anyone's curious, you can look up like some examples they did for Dune which was an amazingly filmed movie. My God, I can't, that's cinematography, creme de la creme. And if you look at how it looks on the panoramic normal six, or 17 by nine, you know, rectangle versus what it was designed to be on the IMAX. I mean, you can see that there was like an almost entire ships cut off on top. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's crazy how much they cut out that they had built in VFX land and probably spent weeks making. That's just not d non-existent in that shot on that panoramic look. So yeah, it and, that's, and it's like that's that's just, it's happened before when when I was young because all of your televisions were were like a square ratio. Yes, and yeah. when we'd go to the theater, you'd see movies in the theater on the widescreen, and and they would have the full feature. Then there was that aggravating feature when I was a kid to switch it to widescreen mode on the square TV. And then everything yeah. just got small, small. But, but it, but it was, it cropped the sides out or it moved the picture within the picture side to side. Yeah. Which are happening. But yeah. it's like the opposite now, like now, now. The, the one you want is the taller, more square one. <laughs> it, well, and it's even more confusing than that now because like every video I make for a client now has to also be edited as a reel. So now I got to make it vertical on a phone and the orientation that you guys are seeing now with the boxes that we're in, I mean, that's, that's a landscape 16 by nine square, right? Or a rectangle. And so everything I filmed it that way. And a lot of things are conducive to, to be viewed that way making a vertical version crops off so much. I mean, it's like literally when I make crop, we, you know, we just, it's what just, it's, it's so here? weird. There's so many aspect ratio. There's more aspect ratios than there's ever been. You're trying to make edits that fit into every category. It's just, again, it, this is why it's just good to have a lot of resolution. So you can kind of do anything you need to with it. But, um, but anyway, that big tangent there, some interesting super, stuff. No, super interesting. Is that, you know, I, I'm not I'm not in the camera world you are but I'm sure plenty of people who are listening to this are in that world trying to 
trying to to do something with themselves i mean that's that's an artistic avenue just just like playing guitar just like painting you know it's yeah. that that is its own and it's extremely techy and extremely you know you know cutting edge current technology level you know you're not yeah. I'm sure there's still there's still probably some people back shooting with super eights and doing stuff like that but why would you now when yeah. you, when you can get the same thing digitally well and that, and there's that big argument that it needs to be actual i mean christopher nolan and quentin tarantino still refuse to film on digital cameras they're still old school film cameras and and i mean people don't even make film anymore basically like they they <laughs> they're getting it out of a vault i guess i i don't like there there's like a handful of directors that exist that still get to film on film uh per year and that's it and then editing that is really snipping and putting film together in other well, sections. Well, that's, that's what's confusing about it is I think at the end, it's still digital conversion. I think you still, is, it all ends up in a digital editor they, and then that's they, how you're editing it. So they take the film and then they convert it into a digital image and then edit it there. Those yeah. eaten bastards. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, it's the same concept with analog. Right, like yeah. recording digitally versus analog. Even if we put it on a an MP3 or a CD, you know, it's like, but it was recorded originally on analog, so it's going to have this warm tonality to it that you just can't get digitally. That's the argument, right? But as yeah. it's like harder and harder to make these arguments, guys. If you do A B test, a lot of people can. I mean, even the trained ear across across the board man just like with with guitar amplifiers you know i i like poking fun because there's so many plugins you got apps yeah. effects you've got kempler modelers and all these things that are not tube amps they're you right. know people say well you gotta you gotta have the tubes because it gives you that natural warm glow and then yeah. also if you get the tubes they just they just break down once a year and you gotta pay a lot of money to fix them all <laughs> right right so and they're they're so close. I'm sure that I don't have the ear to tell. Yeah. But there are some people who probably do, but that line is getting smaller and smaller. That that mm -hmm. that line of people who can and can't tell the difference, you know, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. It's well, and th this actually goes back to our last episode. At some point we brought up how you know, the AI and its perfection and what it can create. And, and eventually the only thing that people are going to care about humans making is stuff that's imperfect. Like that's the attraction to it. And, yes. and that's what analog is. And that's what film is. I mean, there's all kinds of artifacts in it. And like, you know, there's the film grain, like uh, digital, super clean. It doesn't have film grain because it's pristine image. But no, we want the film grain. And it's like, I, I like the film grain. I agree with it. But you, it's like you want to beat this that's stuff it. up to sound like it's old and, and analog and imperfect it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Over compress it, make it, you know, it wasn't, maybe it wasn't the best take, keep the, keep the flub in there. Yeah, I love yeah. And I, I, I love that. I, I don't like the, you can tell when it's copied from, from if a guitar player yeah. says, okay, I played the verse and I'll play same thing in the next one. And it's exactly the same. It's like, it's yeah, there's no, there's no subtle differences and you do get that. You can get that. You know, with with digital too, you just have to make it a point to to stop stop editing and leave it, you know, yeah. leave the action in there and play and play off of it again, which is like kind of I feel like that's kind of like our motto. We play off our weaknesses. Yeah. That's to, the idea. Yeah, to to make to make something that's that's wonderful or or inspiring. Most definitely play off the weaknesses. I've beat the hell out of you know, I've had I've come back with filming especially when i was first starting and i didn't have this philosophy yet and i was freaking out at how terrible some of my footage looked i was like we got all these people involved there's all this noise in the footage i was didn't realize i was the iso was way cranked up i forgot to check the iso like and this footage was terrible and then i had these other shots just god i wish it all looked like this but these shots aren't nearly as important and i only filmed like that you know, for like half of it. So now I got half of it looking like dog shit. And then I got half of it looking pristine. And it's like the only option here is to make it all look like dog shit and make the dog shit look like diarrhea. So that way it looks intentional. And so I beat the, the terrible footage up even more. And then I beat up all of the pristine footage. And then I was like, 
and we all loved it. It was like, this is awesome. This looks like now it looks like you got this out of a vault. It looked more filmic. It looked like it was just this beaten up, tattered. I put everything you could plaster on it. And now it, it was a look. And uh, ever since then, I realized always, you know, take those those fuck ups, those weaknesses and try to try to turn them into destiny. You know, try and turn them into the guiding light on where you need to take this to make something more original. Yep. Take 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 your weak, weakest point and turn it into your strongest point because you you're the 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 right. It's not that part's not going to accentuate the the parts that happened well. It, yes. it happens the way around. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Maybe this will be the closer on every episode. We'll just try to figure out how to bring it back to the same exact point. <laughs> That's like how we, end. you know, the end of our episode is coming because we're talking about the same motto again. Talking about weaknesses and strongnesses now. That's y'all, right. Y'all because boys we, are predictable. Y'all need to do something else. Because <laughs> we're at our hour, man. We, we, we brought it home right at the hour, Mark. So I'll see you later. Peace. <laughs> Good night, guys. Hey, guys. It's been fun. And uh, check out cuethemuses.com. And really appreciate you guys checking out these episodes. If you are checking them out, please do share. And uh, we are going to put out our... On Thursday. Sorry, you're about to exit. But just to have said it. Well, this is coming out Friday. We're doing... Never mind, guys. I'm all off rhythm. We're filming this ahead of time. So never mind what I said. Love you. Thanks for checking in. Peace. (laughs) Good afternoon. Good evening. And good night.